Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is uh, Dominic Cusmano, and I am the publisher of Longbridge, Longbridge Books. I will be the moderator of today's event, The Italian Piazza, a public reading and virtual tour with readings by Mark Frutkin and photos by Vincenzo Pietropaolo. Please note that this event is being recorded and will be posted on YouTube. We are all in different territories at this time. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that I am located in, on unceded indigenous lands. Jojage, Montreal is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations. We acknowledge them and other First Nations who care for the land across our country, and we recognize them as Canada's first storytellers. I would kindly ask that you remain muted during the presentation. Feel free to type in questions using the chat function on your screen at any time during the proceedings. I will read the questions out during the question period at the end. This presentation is a digital articulation of the book Where Angels Come to Earth, an evocation of the Italian piazza with photos by Vincenzo Petropaolo and lyrical texts by Mark Frutkin, published by Longbridge Books earlier this year. The book contains 160 pages and over 100 photographs of Italian piazzas in color and black and white. Mark and Vince traveled to Italy on three occasions over the past few years, visiting dozens of piazzas throughout the country to docu document life in the piazza in word and image. Some 30 towns and cities in 10 regions of Italy, from Sicily to Venice, are depicted in this presentation. Now a few words about the presenters. Mark Frutkin has published 17 books of fiction, poetry, and nonfiction. His novel, Fabrizio's Return, won the Trillium Award and the Sunburst Prize, and was shortlisted for the Commonwealth Prize. His novel, Atmospheres of Polinaire, was a finalist for the Governor General's Award, and his historical novel, The Artist and the Assassin, to be published 20, in 2021, is based on the life and mysterious death of the artist Caravaggio. <clears throat> One of Canada's preeminent documentary photographers, Vincenzo Petropaolo, is recognized internationally for his work on social justice issues. He has authored or co-authored 12 books of photographs, and his photography is a feature exhibition at the Canadian Museum of, for Human Rights. He was born in Calabria, Italy, and raised in Toronto, where he lives. And now I'd like to turn things over to Vincenzo Pietropaolo. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dominic. And um, um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. And um, good evening or good morning, wherever you may be. Um, <clears throat> the Italian piazza. Now, the Italian piazza, um, for Italians, it's really embedded in their DNA, but for others, it may not be so. So I'll have a few words of introduction before we get into the presentation. The piazza is a public square around which cities and towns are designed. In short, it is a, a brilliant way of organizing cities where all streets lead into and out of the piazza. It is the very core of public social life for Italians and that it seems to be um, something that they've always had and they've always shared with uh, in, their, in, in their daily lives. The piazza, in fact, has been called the living room of the city. And it is within this context that much of the people's daily life takes place. It's the place where the ebb and flow turns with the seasons, where the true heartbeat of a neighborhood is, or the heartbeat of an entire city, if it's a large piazza. The piazza is an inherently democratic place in that it is owned by no one, and yet it is owned by everyone in unison. Where no one may be denied access and all can gather, children playing, people strolling, shopping, simply resting by the fountain. Surrounded by the grand architecture of churches and palazzi, where you know, for, and you also know, um, where you know the historical events have occurred for hundreds of years, and therefore you are never too far from your history. It is a place where you go to meet your friends, where you go to a street market or a farmer's market. It is a place where you have the cafe, where you go for a business encounter or perhaps an amorous encounter or for street theater or where you gather for social celebrations or, or even political protests or sports victories. But it, also, it is also the place where you go to pay your taxes or where you go for spiritual fulfillment. For there's a government palazzo or a city hall at one end usually and a church at the other with a fountain of gurgling water often, giving the piazza both a secular and spiritual anchor, the duality of church and state, 
which is the way we have organized much of our, many of our societies. The piazza embodies the ancient tradition of the public sphere by providing a setting where ideas are discussed and exchanged informally. And so it becomes a catalyst that helps to foment the ideas of individuals into the ideas of the entire community. And in this regard, we recall the words of Jane Jacobs, the great Canadian American urbanist who reminded us that cities have the capacity of providing something for everybody only because and only when they are created by everyone. By capturing moments in words and images in the lives of the people who use the piazza as they go through their daily life, we have attempted to show not necessarily the architectural history, but the humanity and social integrity of the Italian piazza. And now a few glimpses of the visual journey of what we call the piazza experience. But it is all the more ironic and sad today that the piazza are currently empty as Italians are staying home in order to control the spread of COVID-19. And so we present um, our book and our, and our talk today, looking forward to better days when the piazzas can become full of life again. So as I was saying, this is Piazza del Campo in downtown Rome. And we started off with this photograph because Piazza del Campo, uh, um, sorry, I'm, because I um, got so confused here with the techno, this is actually Piazza dei Monti in downtown Rome. And Piazza dei Monti is a, it's a wonderful little piazza with a major fountain in it. But what struck me about this photograph and Mark and I as we were looking at it is because is that it is like a little play on a stage. The piazza forms a stage where daily life takes play. It's a, there's a, someone sitting by the fountain by himself, someone having a drink of water, um, children playing, cars way in the background. Uh, the, the piazza is like no longer allowed, you know, cars are no longer allowed there. So, the, so the, this small piazza becomes really um, a little stage uh, for part of the city. And Mark? Okay, I'm going to be reading a selection of texts from the book, and this is the first one. This is a story that meanders, a story that does not fear squandering a little time, a story that takes time for a little conversation here and there, a conversation about nothing, or almost nothing, it is true, but it is a story that does not fret about arriving on the minute. It is willing to be late, if that means the opportunity to see a friend or neighbor, an opportunity for a glass of wine, not gulped, but taken in vivid sips, each enjoyed on its own as if one could make a single glass last an entire afternoon. This is a true story then, and like all stories, it has a plot, but we don't know what the plot is until we round a corner and see a stone lion or a lofty tower or an old man on a bicycle. And everything changes because that could be us pedaling lazily with nowhere to go, but pedaling still in wavering circles, circling the square, circling the square. Vince? This is uh, Piazza del Campo in uh, Santa Severini, Severina, a small town, a uh, hilltop town in Calabria. It is an ancient city which has an elliptical shaped piazza. And I photographed the piazza from the castle looking towards the church, which again shows you the duality of the church and the state. The slide shows graphically how all the buildings are situated in relation to the piazza. Uh, everybody and everything has a relationship with the piazza. People form groups, they stroll, etc. This is Piazza Dispersi in Guerra, or the piazza for those lost at war, in Majorato in Calabria. And Majorato is actually the place where I was born. The flower arrangement is to mark the Feast of the Corpus Domini in front of the church, made of ginestre, which is a wild flower with a very unusual fragrance. The statue on the left is dedicated to the fallen soldiers. Therefore, once again, you have the church and the state, the spiritual and the secular. This is a sandstone um, sculpture of an angel in a small uh, church in a cave just outside the piazza in Pizzo, in a small place called Piedigrotta, outside the town of Pizzo in Calabria. This little church was built as a kind of um, uh, to, to commemorate a shipwreck in the 18th century. 
And again, the piazza in the piazza history is always near you. This is Piazza del Campo in Siena, probably one of the most famous piazzas of Italy. Um, Campo, by the way, means a field. And the piazza was originally a marketplace in the 13th century. Uh, talk about constancy of history in, in, in Italy. The piazza is shaped like a seashell, symmetrically divided into nine sections, sloping on a hill and facing the Palazzo Pubblico with its medieval crenellations and tower to spread its shadow across the square as if, as if it were claiming it. Uh, for for the city. Mark. Picture a time release photograph that reveals itself over a thousand years. At the beginning, the piazza doesn't yet exist. What will become the piazza is a meadow, an open space between hills. Seasons turn, time passes. What will become the piazza is now a field planted with vineyards and rows of vegetables. Seeds are placed in soil, plants grow, flowers blossom, vegetables ripen and are picked. Time passes. The photograph resolves into buildings, first a stable and a stone house, then a church and baptistry, then a city hall. Nothing has been done to build the piazza. It merely appears among the buildings as if by magic. That's Campo dei Fiori in, uh, in downtown Rome, the historic center of Rome. And Campo dei Fiori um, is the focal point of the whole area of that part of Rome. The central element is a statue of Giordano Bruno, a Dominican friar and philosopher who was burned at the stake for heresy in, six, in the year 1600 in the very piazza that we're looking at. He was burned at the stake, of course, um, for ex questioning many of the accepted beliefs of the day and insisting that, among other things, the planet Earth moved around the sun. By the way, the name of the piazza means field of flowers. In Campo dei Fiori, of course, there is a, a marketplace and there are itinerant musicians and many people who just sort of uh, stroll about. Mark? The Romanian musician comes to the piazza every day to play his bass fiddle. He is married to his instrument. There may have even been a church service with an Orthodox priest and witnesses. The instrument is like a contented wife who purrs when he strokes her. But still, he worries. She likes to eat. She never has enough to eat. The worry has formed lines on his face like a map of the Balkans, a thousand dry stream beds and a mountain. As he drags her away from the crowd, he looks back over his shoulder as if to say, what can I do? I love her, but still, I worry. This is Piazza Navona in uh, Rome again, and there's a general protest taking place in the context of the exquisite Fontana del Nettuno, Neptune's fountain, which dates back from the late, uh, to the late 1500s. The speeches of the politicians and speakers uh, intermingled with the sounds of the running water. And this particular day was a general strike, a general protest against uh, social cuts of the government of the day. The people uh, protesting have a sign that says, Lo sciopero è giusto, which really means that the strike is just, that is to say that it is morally justified. Back to Siena, Piazza del Campo. These two ladies are walking in, in, in Piazza del Campo and you notice how the, the very intricate uh, herringbone work of the, you know, the bricks uh, is done. It's just quite, quite exquisite, quite amazing. And, and it's very precise and strong and durable because the, they have a palio or a horse race, the palio de, la, de, la, de, palio de the famous palio de Siena, which is a medieval horse race. And these bricks actually withstand all, all of that. Mark. Two old ladies with white hair and matching canes stand on the herringbone bricks of the piazza. They stand on the feet of their long morning shadows, which moment by moment shrink like a water stain in the sun, like the memories of a lifetime. They could be sisters or old friends. Invisible words pass between them. They look frail as sticks. 
the afternoon of their future is short and filled with naps. In Siena still, Piazza del Duomo, this, um, <clears throat> what, this is one of the newer residents of Italy, an African-Italian woman um, sitting on the church steps. Italy was once an exporter of its people as millions emigrated. Now, of course, with this population dwindling, dwindling and it's uh, also aging, it needs to attract immigrants and immigration is a very major issue in Italy at the moment. Santa Maria in Trastevere. Uh, the fountain in this case, this is part of the fountain. The fountain is visible from inside the church and from the altar, altar of the church, you can actually see the fountain. Um, and this particular church, the Church of Santa Maria in Trastevere has no steps. So you can actually you know, easily walk or roll into the church. It's as if the piazza were extending itself into the church and, and as if the church were spilling itself onto the piazza. Uh, Mark. Um, this, yes, this is in Trastevere, a lovely section of, of Rome. A young man sleeps on the steps of the fountain. Like a statue by Michelangelo, he sleeps the sleep of the dead, sunlight on his sculptured hand, head thrown back, clothing disheveled. At the top step of the fountain, splayed out on an altar, he becomes a homeless offering to the city, left out for the gods at night, and still there, unretrieved, in the morning. All night he heard the sound of water, and dreamt he slept in a woodland glade. His hand is open, as if about to receive a coin, or the key to the city, or a letter that will change his life. The amazing thing about a piazza is that you can pretend you're alone when you're not, and even in the context that you're actually uh, in a crowd. So you can be alone by yourself in the piazza, uh, or you can be part of a large crowd. This young couple happily kissed in front of my camera, right at my feet, seemingly oblivious to me. And this is in Piazza del Popolo in Ascoli Piceno, which is in, in the Marche region of Italy, in central Italy. Mark? Yes, you do have to be careful what you're doing when Vincenzo, when Vincenzo is close by with a camera. <laughs> when lovers kiss on the piazza, the world is their witness. The kiss is a public statement of love and affection, not quite a vow spoken out loud, but a statement nonetheless, one there for all to see, in front of the powers of church and state, before neighbors, citizens, family, and friends, even if they aren't present, word will soon find them. The couple turns each to the other, face to face, eye to eye, mouth to mouth, and partakes in a kind of sacrament, a form of centuries old ritual, a type of worship that predates religion. The a server in, in the Cafe Lorenz in Ascoli Piceno again, and this particular cafe is one of the most historic cafes in all of Italy. Ascoli Piceno is a city that predates the founding of Rome. Um, and it's a, a remarkable city that's very little known outside of Italy. In the same city, there's another piazza called Piazza San Francesco, which serves as, as the main uh, marketplace. Here, a local farmer retired, who only grows a few things in his garden. This is his entire output, what you see in the photograph uh, here. He's able to offer everything for sale. He has basically a few eggs, some honey, some garlic, a cheese. Um, but the piazza is, is his venue. The piazza is inclusive, which is an, is an essential element of the piazza. Mar markets and uh, like grocery stores, Italians buy their groceries in, in, in markets until COVID anyways. COVID has changed a lot of things. And uh, this is Campo de Fiore in Rome. Here's a, a Moroccan immigrant who is uh, slicing an artichoke uh, that he's uh, offering for sale. Now we go to Sicily, and this is a town of Shikli, which is a heritage town in the southeast corner of, uh, of the island. Shikli is famous for its ancient carved um, uh, dwellings into the hills uh, around the city and right in the city. These are hills made of sandstone or tufo in Italian. 
And these dwellings used to be used for actually for habitation by people until about World War II or, or thereabouts. And now they have been uh, all converted into uh, boutiques, uh, artisan shops, shops of all kinds, and such as this particular tinsmith. Mark? In Shikli, the tinsmith stands in front of a tiny cave that serves as his shop. Carved out of the mountainside, the shop is about eight feet long and four feet deep and opens onto a small piazza. When we found him waiting on a wooden chair inside, he had an open fire going. It was as if he were sitting inside a chimney, his face and hands blackened, his clothes worn, shoes ancient. How much could he earn repairing tin objects in a world where he lives next to stacked sugar cube apartments with satellite dishes on their balconies? When Vince raises his camera, the tinsmith, like someone posing for a photograph a hundred years ago, does not know he is supposed to smile. Piazza del Popolo, which means the people's piazza, aptly named uh, in, in Ascolipiceno again. The wonderful thing about this, this ancient city is that it's full of porticos, and you can go for a stroll even, uh, even in the rain. Uh, Mark? Two girls walk arm in arm across the piazza. A photographer is like a fisherman, Giorgio, the stick-thin custodian, tells me as we stand on the steps in front of the church overlooking the square. I nod in agreement. The photographer must have the same patience as the fisherman, ever alert to the precise moment when the shutter must be pressed, the rod lifted, the line pulled tight. The photographer must have perfect timing to catch a fish of light glistening in air. For the moment passes in an instant. The scene has changed. The two girls walking arm in arm have crossed the piazza, turned a corner, disappeared, into the rest of their lives. I came upon a wedding in the small town of Pizzo, Pizzo Calabria, and the couple is sitting, is standing right on the edge, waiting for the photographer to take their photograph while the grandmother is just uh, chatting to others nearby. Um, this particular piazza overlooks a cliff. And if you stand by the railing, there's an, you feel an incredible sensation uh, as you look down at the tiny harbor and the beach, which are about 50, 60 meters uh, below you. So this is the view that you get from the piazza just by standing at the, at the railing where the couple was standing. Mark? So I should point out that this text actually does not appear in the book um, because I wrote this text after I saw the book and this photograph struck me as just being so um, interesting that I had to write this piece. A young bride in white on the far left and an old woman dressed all in black on the far right bookend the two sides of this photo. The verticals in the photo, the three standing figures, including the groom, are connected by several strong horizontals, an iron pipe along the stone wall in the background, the top railing of the steel fence along the piazza's edge, and the bride's long white train. The train, foam of wave upon wave, connects the two women in the photo. The bride next to her groom looks down, imagining her future. The old woman, all in black but with white hair, looks away in the opposite direction toward the past. The viewer can imagine that the old woman is the bride many years down the road. This photo manages to capture in a single moment, a truth about the ineluctable passage of time. This mural um, is in a small town called Latino in the mountains of Campania, Campania region, which, which is where near Naples, basically where Naples is. We wanted to have this picture in the book because it symbolizes the closeness between Italy and Canada as a result of immigration, but not just Italy and Canada, Italy and other countries. Millions of people left Italy in the 19th and 20th centuries, moving to places all over the world. Uh, Italian towns became depopulated as Italians populated cities like Toronto, Montreal, New York, Caracas, Rio de Janeiro, Buenos Aires, 
Melbourne, and many other places. And, and so I thought it was amazing that to have this mural in the town because on the one hand, you have the, the village, the waves hand, the, the, the hands waving, and then the ship sailing across the sea. And in my travels in Italy, I, just, I came unexpectedly upon two piazzas that have been renamed Piazza Toronto, which shows the closeness between Toronto, uh, which is the city where I'm located, uh, where, where, I, where I grew up. Uh, it shows the closeness between Toronto and, and uh, Italy in that so many uh, residents of Toronto actually are from uh, small towns all, all over Italy. The town of Guardiareggia in Molise is, which is the place which has a particularly beautiful Piazza Toronto. And the word Piazza has now entered the uh, English lexicon in that we have a Piazza Lombardi in Toronto and we also have a Piazza Verona in uh, the city of Windsor, Ontario. This is the um, Palio degli Asini, which is the medieval donkey race of the city of Alba in Piemonte. Now the donkey is a humble animal, but a stubborn one too. And if, th if you think that having a donkey race is easy, it's because you've never tried it. Unlike horses, donkeys don't obey commands. So you can imagine the hilarious result of this race. Well, though the race is steeped in the history of Alba, the event was temporarily banned during fascism because it was considered to be, quote, a frivolous activity unbecoming of the Italian character. The wonderful thing about the Palio degli Asini is that it is strictly controlled to protect the animals from abuse. And by the way, the winner um, takes away only the, basically wins the right to display his, his or her neighborhood's banner uh, at City Hall for one year. This is a glimpse of the, uh, of the donks, which sometimes just all of a sudden decide to stop midway and they won't move. So anyway, it's a wonderful event to, which again takes place in the piazza. The living room of the city. Uh, this piazza looks like it's been tiled much like a living room. This is travertine, travertine marble. It's been uh, laid out very symmetrically. Um, and it is a breathtaking sight because, especially because in the rain, when you have the, the reflections of the castle, the crenellations of the castle, you can see very, very, very faintly the orange reflections right in the marble of the piazza. And again, this is uh, Ascoli Piceno. Violin makers in Piazza Zaccaria, which is right off Piazza del Comune in the city of Cremona in uh, Lombardia in Northern Italy. Cremona is the city of Stradivarius, which is full of violin makers. From the window of this atelier, you can observe the life in the piazza. And from the, from the outside the piazza, you can look inside the window and see these two um, violin makers at work. We befriended Gaspar and Sibyl, who gifted us their precious time for the sake of my camera and the sake of Mark's pen. Mark? On the main piazza in Cremona, one musician passes a violin to another. The violin weighs almost nothing, a handful of rose petals. A badly played piece of music weighs more. When the violin is lifted into your hands, it is difficult to feel its presence, to know when you have a grip on it. That's why the violin is passed by holding the left hand under the neck and the right hand under the body as one would pass a sleeping infant. The violin's volume of sound and the depth and beauty of its voice is in direct proportion to the lack of weight it takes from the world. The music pre-exists within the instrument. The violin speaks to us with the confidence and intimacy of our own thoughts. The sounds of the piazza and are many and um, in this case, school children are taking a little break and making their own music. Um, the piazza, of course, functions as a playground. So kids sometimes just hang around us, you know, it, it, it's in kind of an open playground. This is the city of Tropea um, on the west side of Calabria on a cliff. And the piazza is called the Faccio dei Sospiri, or the lookout of size. The lookout of size because when you look over, over um, you know, across the piazza, you see a breathtaking view of the ocean. 500 meters below. It's quite breathtaking. 
a funeral march. And a funeral march in the small town of Pizzo again, funerals usually take place in the piazza because that's where the church is. In this case, the band was playing because the father of one of its members had passed away. And in this way, the band decided to pay their final respects collectively. Uh, uh, bands uh, at funerals are unusual in Italy, and so this was quite an unusual situation. And uh, I just want to point out the posters on the left side of the pictures, which are posters of people who, the names of people who have recently passed away. This is how you announce the obituaries in, in, in Italy. This is the Piazza Vecchia, uh, or its proper name, that's the common name, the, uh, the old piazza. The real name is called Piazza Salvaggio uh, in the town of Magliarato. And the festival is a festival of the giant puppets, or i pupi, which are made of papier-mâché papier and which represent two Arab characters, Mata and Griffone, a female and a person of color male, recalling the times when the south of Italy was under Arab domination. Another glimpse of the, the Pupi in, in Calabria. And going on to a, a, a kind of a landscape of sound, the soundscape of the piazza is exemplified by this lady, Annunciata, who is 69 years old. She climbed about 70 steps four times a day to the top of the Campanile or the bell tower. And the town's bells signal key moments in the day like the Matutino or the Bon Matin, at dawn, at noon hour, and the Vespers, with births and deaths and weddings in between. Now to Mark. On a sleepy Sunday afternoon in November in the village of Dona Lucata in extreme southern Sicily, a place that sometimes feels like the end of the world, the church bell tower has a clock with no hands. Down the road in the small city of Sheikli, a cluster of stone saints on the facade of a church are so worn by rain and weather and time that their features have begun to disappear. Nighttime in the piazza. This is Santa Maria di Formosa in Venice and a little known piazza of Venice. Little known because most tourists usually end up sp spending their time along the canal, the, 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 the Canal Grande. But if you should uh, go for a walk in Venice after the tourists have gone to bed um, or during dinner hour when everybody's in the restaurants, the tranquility and serenity and the foreboding mysterious quality of the city is just uh, stunning, such as this, this very, very small uh, piazza, Formosa. And as we begin to end our journey, we go back to Santa Severina uh, in Calabria, the hilltop town whose origins stayed back to the 19th century BC. It was once a Byzantine trading center, and it has been included in the list of the most beautiful towns of Italy. Mark. The wall is saturated in color. Warm yellow, dusty tan, rich browns and blacks, earthy red. Not color on the surface alone, but as if the wall were soaked, infused with pigment, as if the color has been sinking into the wall for centuries and then the setting sun ignites the wall and two flames are brought together into one. The flame of 10,000 sunsets from the past arising from within the wall's depth and the flame of this present fleeting radiance, adding another layer to the wall's history of light. So we end with, um, with this, Stromboli volcano. Italy is a land of uh, volcanoes. It has three volcanoes. And Stromboli is the, uh, the smallest one. It's a small island, which you can see from, the, from Calabria across the Mediterranean Sea, some 30 mm -hmm. kilometers. Um, and if you should stand at Piazza del Cannone in the city of Trapea in the month of September, in the late September, the sun will set right over the, the cone of the volcano. It's a, it is quite a breathtaking view as people jostle to, to take a position right by the iron ra railing. Um, again, as it's, a, it's as if you're looking out your window. Mark? You're standing in the Piazza del Canone in the small city of Tropea in Calabria, high above the coastline of the gods. 
looking across the Tyrrhenian Sea to the live Stromboli volcano. The photographer's eyes, eye has become your eyes. As you stand there on the piazza looking out, you realize that a piazza, like a book, is full of stories. Stories about lovers, actors, priests, and widows. Stories about the sea, the sunset, the volcano. The path of light the sun lays across the water leads right to this piazza, to this book, to your own story. And this concludes our, our visual tour. And I would like to um, also apologize for those yellow streaks on the pictures, which I don't know where they turned up from. They weren't there earlier this morning. And if someone <laughs> has a clue as to what happened there, I would appreciate knowing about it. Some of the people were very quick in the beginning. Very embarrassing, but I have no idea what, why they're there. Now I'll pass it on to Dominic now. Uh, thank you, Vince. Uh, um, I am mystified by those streaks as well. I think sometimes we do our very best and uh, sometimes things don't go as well as we'd like them to go, but I think they were not uh, a major distraction to the wonderful photos that we've seen and uh, to hearing um, Mark's uh, really, really uh, very um, lyrical text, right? beautiful text. Um, while I prepare to ask my first question, I'd like to, to invite everyone else, everyone who's with us, to uh, maybe ask some questions, uh, prepare your questions in the chat, and I will read them out. Or if you have any comments as well, uh, you can uh, write them in. I've received a couple already. But before I uh, read them, I would like to uh, ask my, the very first question. And the question goes to both of you, uh, gentlemen. And um, perhaps you have a different uh, angle, a different response to the question. But uh, how did this book come about? I mean, I, I, I know the so sort of the story a little bit on the surface of it, but what is the, the underlying sort of, uh, what were the underlying mechanics that came about that, that led to this book? Can I answer that? Sure, by all means. Okay. I was sitting in a piazza in Cremona um, on a lovely afternoon and uh, the sun was setting and I was having a glass of wine at a table, at cafe table on the edge of the piazza and as the sun was going down, it was throwing shadows from the um, crenellations on the top of the town hall across the piazza, along uh, onto each of the columns that went across the front of the church and the tower. And as the sun went down, each shadow climbed each right up each column. And I thought, there's an incredible order here. And then um, the piazza had been more or less empty. And then 20 minutes later, it was, filled, it was filled with 200 people. And it was a Friday afternoon, late on a Friday afternoon, and people were just coming home from work, from school, stopping by to meet with each other and talk. And it really gave me this sense that the piazza is a gathering place. And so I thought, be really interesting to do a book on piazzas. And I was telling this to a friend of mine, a, a writer in Ottawa, Barb Sibold, and she said, oh, I know someone who should work on that book. She knew Vincenzo. He's a photographer in Toronto. And so she put us together and we made, ended up making three trips together to, um, to Italy for Vince uh, to photograph, piazzas and for me to write about piazzas and thus um, the book appeared. And that mutual friend was Barbara Sybil, who I noticed is joining us today. So thank right. you Barbara once again. Thank you Barbara. <laughs> and of course I, I as a child I um, when Mark approached me with this idea as a child I I grew up in a piazza as all children we went, went we went out to play and you just went to the piazza to play and everybody looked after you. I mean, all the people on, you know, this was a small village. So there was no formal playground. It's, so the piazza kind of has a, had a kind of, um, you know, a sensation for me. And it was an opportunity for me to do a new kind of documentation. Okay. Um, so the first question uh, from an anonymous uh, sender uh, says, beautiful, uh, thanks, Mark and Vincenzo. How did you choose the piazzas? Did you have specific criteria for choosing the ones you chose? 
Well, we set out to, um, that, was a, that was a very difficult thing to do, to choose the piazzas. And we started by saying, okay, let's forget about the very famous piazzas. Let's go into the small towns, the small cities, and look for piazzas that are not very famous, at least outside of Italy. But then we saw some of the larger piazzas again, and then you just can't, the temptation is too strong, which is why we had Piazza Navona, because also Piazza Navona had, had major political events in it, and, and politics is such a big part of Italian life. So we had to include uh, that kind of a piazza. So it, we want to include the north, south, you know, and, and the middle, the central part of Italy also. So we went as far as Sicily, and really as far north as Venice, Milano, Firenze, Campania, Molise, Calabria. Um, and uh, so whenever I traveled on my own, uh, this is after Mark and I did our bulk of the work, I always photographed anyway. So there's a few pictures in the book, which I did, you know, in my own travels. Um, but that, you know, it was, a, again, I don't know how, how Mark feels about how, how we made our choices, but <laughs> Mark. Um, well, we both, Vince and I did a fair bit of research about which piazzas to, to visit. And that's one reason why we came across the, uh, for example, the piazza in Alba that has a donkey race. Um, I read about that somewhere and we ended up going there at the time that the donkey race was happening and, and Vince photographed that. And Vince also did lots of research every time he went to Italy because he, he was going to Italy, at, I think in those years, almost every year. And he would travel around and keep his eyes open and photograph constantly. And um, so we, there was a fair bit of research, both in books and on foot. Okay. And uh, the person that identified herself uh, who, who sent that question, that was uh, Rosa Maria Durand. I think a friend of yours, Mark. Yes. Thank you, Rosa Maria. Uh, all right. <laughs> now we have a question from someone from Naples. Uh, Renata Coppola asks, could I ask why there were no pictures of Naples? I am from Naples and we have many uh, fountains and piazzas in Naples. Uh, Vince, do you want to take that one? Well, I, I've, I've been asked uh, that similar question many times by other people who are from different cities. And we had to, at the end of the day, we can only go to so many places and the book could only be so large. There's uh, over 100 photographs in the book. And Naples, of course, is a, is a key component, but so is Palermo, which is, which is not in the book. So is um, Messina and Cagliari and many, many, many cities. It's impossible to do a book like that. Um, any choice that you make, I think, is going to be controversial in that way. Yeah. So our, our, our next edition will include Naples. Oh, that's great. <laughs> Volume two. <laughs> but really, that, that's, that's the extent of it. It's just a matter of research. We had very limited resources. And we ended up yeah. going to the cities where we did. And, and uh, um, you know, we did the best we could that way. A question for Mark. Uh, Mark uh, seems to have a fascination with Italy. What sparked it? Um, the original spark for me was the fact that um, my roommate in my second year of university, um, who was actually um, of Lebanese extraction, he convinced me to accompany him and uh, many other students to spend our third year of university um, in Rome, because the school we were attending in Chicago had a campus in Rome. And so I spent my third year of university in Rome and traveled all over Italy. And I got turned on to the Italian, um, you know, things like um, wine, food, you know, beautiful piazzas, lovely people and all sorts of stuff like that. So I've been uh, very interested in Italy ever since. And I, I think I have at least three, three or four novels that I've written that are set in Italy. And in fact, in fact, my new one coming out in the spring is about the Italian painter Caravaggio. Uh, question for, uh, for Vince or more of a commentary uh, Tim Wynne Jones writes, the image of the boat and the village and the hands waving made me think of refugees from Africa and the hands of those uh, growing people, drowning people, I mean. I wonder if you can comment on that. 
Well, I think that's a, that's also a very interesting interpretation because the 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 tables have been reversed now. The situation is reversed. Whereas I said earlier, Italy used to be an exporter of people; it is now an importer of people. Um, sometimes uh, not very willingly. And the reality now in Europe, of course, is the migration from uh, from the African continent in particular um, that needs a place to go. And so that's I think that that's one way of looking at that mural. I think when the mural was painted, it was painted with the idea of um, of um, an homage to the people who had left, who had depopulated the towns of the south of Italy and, and populating the cities of the Americas in particular in Australia. Um, but the reality of immigration was that all those European countries uh, from, you know, the, in the 19th century and the 20th century now have to receive uh, new populations. And that's become a very difficult issue for, for many of them. But I don't think there's any way around that. I think that the world is always. Um, so can I just maybe take one minute to tell a very personal story about my own migration in my, my own hometown of Mayrat in Calabria. I was visiting the, the town about five, six years ago, and there was a young boy playing hide and seek. And um, I, I saw him playing hide and seek from the balcony of the house where I was born, looking down onto the little street. And uh, uh, as he, um, finished he, as he ran to, to find to find his friends he saw me and said buongiorno and I thought oh my god ch Italian children are so polite isn't that wonderful and then his mother called him and they had a conversation he from the street she from her balcony around the corner I couldn't see his, I could see his mother but the conversation was in a foreign language the conversation was in Romanian and I, and I realized wow that child is playing hide and seek exactly in the spot where I used to play 50 years ago and, and, and I left that town and it came to North America and made, made a new life in North America. And I, and I left, in a way, I left the spot. And that spot has not been taken over by that child, by that young boy. So the world is always turning. People are always migrating. And we can't, we can't escape that reality. Very interesting. Uh, a question from uh, Lauren. Uh, Vincenzo, you mentioned several times in describing your photos, details about the subjects like the Moroccan immigrant in the market. During this tour, did you often stop to speak with people you photographed? What sort of impact did they leave on you and how do you view your work? Or, and how you, and how you view your work? Well, yes, I, I try and talk to as many people as possible when I photograph them. And uh, so you create, you try and create a rapport with them. I think the Moroccan uh, individual, um, he, um, you know, he felt very proud to be photographed and uh, he felt very happy to be able to contribute to this. We gave them photographs, all the people that we photographed, we, we mailed them photographs where, whenever possible. Sometimes it was impossible to get their address if they were in a street scene, but in situations where there are portraits. So yes, definitely I talk to people and I, and I work with, with that perspective in mind. And that impacts my work. It impacts how I view people, how I, how, how I represent them in my own work. And I think I represent them in a way with their consent as much as possible. And I, I like the old dictum that a, um, a, good, a good portrait uh, in photography, a good portrait is not taken, a good portrait is given. And in a sense, it's given to you by the person in front of the camera. Mm. I think the photographer nice. has, has to be able to, uh, in, a, in a sense, accept that, that gift. That's how I see the photographs for the most part. Mm. Yeah, if I, if, if I can add, um, I, I thought it was quite interesting going through Italy with, with Vincenzo because we would strike up these conversations with people we were, he was photographing and, and uh, it, it made a very fascinating trip for me. Um, we, we really had a nice conversation with that, that Romanian musician and the um, in the cafe in Ascoli Piceno, we had um, a really nice um, relationship with the waiters and waitresses there because uh, he was photographing them. And uh, so it was, it, it really added a lot to, uh, to, you know, traveling around for me to have someone who spoke fluent Italian <laughs> and was very outgoing. Um. 
Mark, maybe you can pick up on this question as well. Uh, life in these marvelous piazzas, this is from Marion. Life in these marvelous piazzas has survived centuries. Can they survive mass tourism? Uh, actually, well, uh, uh, that, is, that is a question that uh, w when one visits uh, Venice, that question definitely comes up. Uh, it's, Venice is pretty overwhelmed. Um, other places, I think, can handle it better. Florence, I guess, is a bit overwhelmed. But uh, Rome is such a big city that I don't feel that it's overwhelmed by mass tourism. Um, but Venice, it's pretty painful to see how the tourists are definitely overwhelming this medium-sized city. Um, but there's a reason they're there. It's the most beautiful city in the world. Everybody wants to see it. It's completely different. It's, it's fantastic. So, you know, I don't know, maybe at some point they have to put limits on the number of people coming into the city. I don't know. I think the answer is to bar those uh, monstrous um, uh, cruise ships. <laughs> yes, that, that would be a good first step because they're causing uh, water problems too. Yeah. Uh, okay, a question from, uh, let me see. Uh, yes, from Anders. Anders comments, beautiful photographs and words. Thank you both. There's a funny irony in the context to speak of downtown Rome, isn't there? Do you see anything vaguely analogous to the piazza in North America? Uh, Vincenzo, Vince, do you want to? Well, um, no, I don't, because the piazza, first and foremost, uh, I'm glad you asked that question, because uh, I think it's a very important question. The piazza, first and foremost, is a public place where anyone can go there and, and just be themselves. And so you cannot go and be yourself in a shopping mall, which is some people think is the closest thing we have to a place where people gather, a public place like that. Uh, in, in, uh, in, as a Canadian in Canada, we, we, have, we have green parks, which are different than, than the piazzas. Uh, green parks are beautiful in their own way, in a different way. So the piazza, in a way, is, um, um, you know, like no one can build on it, no one can touch it. It's there for everybody for centuries. And that's an unusual concept. And all the streets kind of revolve around it. North American cities tend to be built uh, on a grid. And so it's more difficult to create a piazza. And, and sometimes we have attempted to create open spaces like that, but they're rather artificial um, in the sense that they don't have any anchors. The piazza always has these anchors of a, a main church or a main uh, palazzo um, and, a, and, a, and a focal point of a, of a, um, a monument or a, or a fountain. So it's a, it's a different way of life in, in, us, in, in, uh, in that sense altogether. I'm reminded of the film Cinema Paradiso by Giuseppe Tornatore, where in one scene, there's a person who's a, a street person. And he goes running around after midnight in the piazza and he says, la piazza mia, la piazza mia, uh, screaming. And if, in effect, at night, the piazza can be his also, and no one can throw him out. It's like, no one can be an undesirable in the piazza. That's a very interesting concept for me. Mark, did you want to add uh, any comment? No, I think that's uh, I think that's a good good response. I I agree with everything Vincenzo said. Okay. Thank you. Uh, one other question or a comment followed by I guess a question. This is from Manuela in Italy. Thank you, Vincenzo and Mark, for your respectful but also free insight on such a uh, public private Italian space, our piazzas. As an Italian, I feel very moved for this sincere interpretation and we Italians, uh, but everybody who loves Italy too, need your, your foreigners eyes full of memories and references. How do you replace elsewhere the lack of piazzas? Any ideas? <laughs> well, in, uh, in, uh, I know that in Toronto we are having discussions about reshaping some parts of our cities and we are looking at the Italian piazza as a, as a, a way, as a starting point, as an inspiration. You can't just plop the piazza out of nowhere. It has to evolve and develop over time. And our cities were not built like that. And of course, the weather, the weather is a big component of it and that we have very, very long winters. That, that's for sure. But certainly the Italian piazza, the idea of inclusivity, which is why I mentioned Jane Jacobs in my, in my remarks, uh, that, that the, the piazza offers an opportunity for everyone to express an idea. 
and that's the first foundational basis of I think of uh, the you know sort of expressing your idea is a foundational basis of human rights of of of, of democracy. So the piazza becomes as a place a very democratic place. Now, as a photographer, for example, I've been asked to, for example, walking on the street and someone um, like a large in front of a large store, they said, "Well, what are you doing here with the camera? You're very suspicious." In the piazza. No one can say you're you're suspe you know you're you are you, and you certainly can't photograph in a mall because a mall is a private place. Your a mall is made for shopping, not for being, and the piazza is made for for living your daily life. In in, in a nutshell, it's a very it's a very um, interesting discourse that I think we are going to embark upon um, more and more in the future because of COVID. COVID has now um, turned many of the streets of Toronto into semi, semi piazzas in the sense that there are patios right in the middle where there used to be cars. The car has been removed and, and patios for restaurants have, have, you know, have opened up temporarily, at least, you know, at least for this year. So there's a lot of discussion about that. And, and so Italy continues to be an inspiration. Let me just add that um, maybe in, in these times of COVID, our technological piazza is a Zoom screen only if I were to learn to use it better, because I can't get rid. Of, I can't go back and forth in the Zoom now <laughs> on the slideshow. It's stuck. So, okay. But I, uh, I, I know. declare that we 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 actually um, you know rehearsed this and it worked. <laughs> we worked beautifully in the rehearsal. Um, uh, the last question goes to Mark from Bill Baneja. Pardon me if I mispronounce your Bill name. Bill Baneja. Yes. Uh, and Hi, Bill. The question is as follows, Mark, did uh, Piazza and Cremona play, uh, uh, inspire you for Fabrizio's return? Thanks both of you for evocative images and descriptions. Uh, absolutely, my novel Fabrizio's Return is, is set in Cremona and um, the Piazza in, the central Piazza in Cremona was an absolute important influence uh, on that novel. So you're right, Bill. It did. <laughs> Great. So we have surpassed uh, the hour. Uh, so we're going to end it here. Um, I would like to thank all of you for joining us today. Uh, I hope you, you enjoyed this presentation, uh, both in words and images. Uh, this event on Zoom was made possible by the Canada Council for the Arts and the Writers Union of Canada. I would also like to thank our technical host, Licha Canton, for working so hard behind the scenes. If you're interested in purchasing Where Angels Come to Earth, an evocative, uh, uh, an evocation of the Italian piazza, pardon me, please go to uh, www.accenti.ca and follow the links. Uh, and the link also appears on your screen. The entire link is on your screen, accenti.ca slash product slash angels. Um, and without further ado, thank you very much and hope to see you again at another presentation soon.